Okay. So when we first started talking about doing this uh, history of, or uh, you know, current uh, trends in computerization and digitization and um, what the ANS has been up to lately, we talked about maybe looking back uh, historically to see uh, what had happened in the past. And all of it seems to trace right to this gentleman here, Harry Bass, who not only had the um, vision, but also funded um, almost, we would have to say, perhaps 100% of it at that time, I would think, uh, back in the 1970s. So th this was a gentleman that was way ahead of his time. Um, and I'll talk about him in just a moment. Uh, but I was wondering, is there anyone in the room that uh, knew Harry Bass or had ever met him? Okay, that's one, uh, right? Okay. I was stunned to get an email at one point okay. after I'd written early on in the East Island. I, I see. later asked some friends, yeah. was that the Harry Bass? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, I've been talking to people that did know him. Uh, I was talking to uh, the person here that's been here the longest, Garfield Miller, who pretty much does uh, everything around here. Um, he described him as a nice guy. Uh, I've talked to other people who had the same opinion, but also described him as rather, let's say, harsh taskmaster. Uh, he would fly into town and he would stay for these projects multiple days. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about this uh, sofa out here that he would sleep on, and uh, it's almost like an artifact that we're going to have to accession, I think, eventually, because uh, this is something that, he, um, that he's known for. Um, so he's standing here with uh, Margaret Thompson, our longtime uh, Greek curator, uh, on the occasion of her retirement in 1979. Now there's some things to know about Harry Bass, okay? So he was a Texan, um, and he had uh, the typically outsized personality that you would associate with a Texan, I, I understand. <laughs> Uh, he was the first president that wasn't from the Eastern Establishment, uh, and he was actually the first uh, one that didn't uh, live in the Northeast. Uh, he wasn't scholarly, he didn't really publish. Um, his inherited wealth came from his father, who made it all in oil and natural gas. Uh, the other thing about the skier here is that in the 1960s he became chairman of the board of and majority stockholder in uh, Vail Associates, who really kind of made that uh, town and made Vail what it is today. Um, he became interested in that somewhat later in life, I guess, in, in the 1960s, uh, I believe, and all, uh, maybe the 50s, but uh, as we'll see, he, uh, it, well, as we can get to right now, uh, the other thing about him was that he was interested in uh, coin collecting. He became interested in the 1960s. His main thing was collecting uh, dye varieties um, of gold coinage and U.S. federal gold coinage, uh, but he also, uh, he also was a collector of currency. Uh, he became the ANS's pr uh, president in he joined the ANS in 1966 and became its president in January of 1978, uh, resigning in 1984, but his work for the ANS continued through the Harry Bass Foundation, and he died in 1998. Um, so I believe I covered every one of those little pictures. Um, I'd like to say that his influence, of course, lives on. Uh, he was a major benefactor, very generous with the library. Uh, we refer to the library today as the Harry Bass Library, but his, we also s still use the Harry Bass Book Fund. He uh, bought the library, these compact space shaver, saver shelving. Um, I'm not clear whether this is still the same shelving that we have. Okay, not so. I had, somebody had told me that, but it, it certainly looks different. And he was very friendly with the librarians. When he joined in the 1960s, he would come to the ANS and he would always go to the library and uh, would, um, get together with the librarian there, Jeffrey North. Uh, and then this continued on with Frank Campbell, seen here um, later in, in uh, the Uptown uh, headquarters in, at Audubon Terrace. Okay, so the other thing about Harry Bass is that, this is just a stock photo, but uh, he became very early, had very early interest in computerization, and he got into this in, uh, in Texas politics. Uh, he got involved in local Republican Texas politics, and he, they used computer data to uh, analyze voter records and that sort of thing. And he got very involved in the programming. I mean, this is why he was really into the nuts and bolts of it, and you really couldn't pull the wool over his eyes uh, on these matters. Um, I was talking to Skip Hill, who we'll see later, who worked with him uh, here in the late 1970s to establish our first programming, and he said that you really couldn't pull anything over, the, pull the wool over his eyes on anything. In fact, later he um, ran a listserv, I understand, for the R-based software that was running the databases. He had a database for his own coins that was quite uh, uh, detailed, I understand. So here is Wayne uh, Skip Hill. 
Uh, Harry Bass started talking about computerizing the ANS collections in early 1978. So this was really a groundbreaking uh, time to be talking about this sort of thing in museums or you know managing your collections in this way. And he hired uh, Skip here as a consultant, and the result was this 1980 proposal, which is a kind of a fascinating document in its own right. Uh, here's part of it here. Um, you can see kind of it defines these terms in this glossary. I've got a blow up of this page in a moment, but you see off to the right here, it's got kind of the coins and describing a database and how that fits into the whole thing. Because, you're, I mean, if you think back to 1980, uh, not too many of us were aware of these sorts of things. And this is just a, a kind of a page, a blow up of that page. And, you know, I must say they define cursor here, but even well into the 90s, I can remember going to uh, meetings like this and people would have us raise their hands like, okay, who here knows what a cursor is, you know, <laughs> this sort of thing, <laughs> to make sure that everybody was on the same. So this is 1980, you know, I don't know how many people knew what a cursor was back in those days. All right, so here we are. This is the uh, Prime 500 mini computer, which is the result of all this uh, 1980 proposal. And this is really uh, kind of a fascinating thing to me. Um, it is my understanding from some people uh, where this ended up, like when, when uh, they moved, I've been told parts of it, or at least perhaps all of it was still in the basement at the time when they moved there. But you can see this is kind of fills up half this room. I know that this um, printer here costs $4,000. Um, they spent at least $160,000 on this whole operation, including capital costs. Uh, they had to do things like um, uh, put in air conditioning into this room, and for years I understand that it was the only <laughs> room that had air conditioning up at the ANS. And um, a lot of this was software. It cost, you know, $30,000 to do the software for this. Um, I, it's my understanding that, um, it, and you can see them on the front here, it had 18 toggle switches to turn it on. Um, and there were a couple of times where you get some dust in there, and um, I've been told that it, it shut down completely, and you, you'd lose like a three days' work, uh, and they would have to kind of power this thing up with these 16 toggle switches. Um, then here's another view of it here. This is Leslie Elam, uh, the director there for many years at the ANS. There it is there. This kind of got like a lost in space look to it, to me. Um, okay. Uh, and it's worth noting that this was uh, called a mini computer in those days, if you remember that. The microcomputer was the one that sits on your desk, but this is the mini computer. Uh, um. Okay, so, um, oops, so. Uh, George, or, uh, Harry Bass went out and hired a coin enthusiast, uh, George Kuhay, to enter and begin this coin database at the ANS. So by way of introducing George Kuhay to those of you, I don't know how many in the room don't know who he is, but as uh, many or most of you know, from 1994 to two 2015, he was the editor of the Standard Catalog of World Coins and World Paper Money. Uh, what I didn't know, that he was also uh, the editor of the Standard Price Guide to U.S. Scouting Collectibles. Uh, apparently, he was an Eagle Scout. I didn't realize yeah. this. Yeah. Um, he had been working part-time as a photo clerk uh, at the ANS while attending business school at Baruch. Um, here he is again, and here he is today. Uh, he added most of the 300,000 items during the, that were entered during the 1980s. He put in about 60,000 a year. The other thing I didn't realize was that this is kind of, you know, this is kind of a com common numbering system, uh, system for acquisitions and accessions in museums. Uh, but I didn't realize this was really all developed at this time, and it was George that went back into the uh, accession logs, back into, uh, going back to 1858, and added these numbers. So this is his handwriting right here, this 242, and you can see it in this um, Victor, Victor David Brenner accession here. Um, he's given it this, uh, accession number, and this is still, of course, the one that we use today. In fact, the, at the bottom there is from Mantis, our coin database. Uh, so he also had to go around, and he said this took months to complete this first part of the task, to go through and he put the numbers on the back of these uh, boxes. This is how it is in the trays today. And also this numbering system uh, incorporates this zeros uh, numbers here on the left, which are ones that he just couldn't figure out. Um, and so we still have these today uh, that we're not quite sure. And sometimes we do figure that out and we we'll give it a proper accession number and that sort of thing.
Okay, so here's just another view. Here's, uh, most of you know Michael Bates. So the curatorial staff also got involved in doing a lot of the cataloging and uh, work on the COIN database. Uh, he would learn little uh, programming scripts, and I don't know if Michael is here. Sometimes no. he is. Okay. Uh, so um, he wrote some scripts, particularly to print out um, labels for the coin boxes and this sort of thing. So, you know, some of the curatorial staff took to this more than others, it sounds like. <laughs> Okay, so it's a little, this, this part is a little hazy to me. I, I've been in touch with Skip Hill even trying to figure this out. But it, 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 by 1984, and this is um, only four years after that initial report, uh, he, Bass was already looking ahead and he knew that uh, desktop computers were really getting to be the way of the future. And so he was already a, a advocating for the abandonment of the prime machine. So it, it was announced in 1987 that DOS-based IBM computers had been acquired to transition from the prime. Uh, Though, from reading uh, back through the materials, it appears that the conversion wasn't complete until 1995. Uh, also, this uh, still this in, in included uh, Skip Hill, so he was part of this uh, this thing. So, it's not quite clear to me when this big machine was actually retired and pulled off. Uh, I, th I think they went to kind of this um, server type system at some point in the 1980s. And it looks to me here that um, I, I thought this uh, this. Um, on the desktop here of Tantiana Feinberg here. That, that to me looks like per, per, uh, PC, um, whereas these look like uh, terminals over here on the right, so. Um, okay, so thanks to the uh, Internet Archive Wayback Machine, I was able to find, or this isn't the earliest one I found, but the ANS got its first website in 1997. Uh, it was, again, paid for, developed, and, and also uh, hosted and maintained on a server at the Harry Bass Research Foundation. And the reason I, I read that was that high-speed internet service was unavailable in Upper Manhattan at the time, in 1997. So, um, you can see here, it's got a listing for the coins, and um, the database at that time with uh, over 500,000 images was, and, uh, I'm sorry, no images at this time. There were no images that included, of course. Uh, it made the descriptions, uh, the records, available on its website here. Uh, in 1997. The images would come later uh, when they converted to FileMaker in 2002. Oh, the other thing to mention here is this numismatic, uh, which you, many of you are familiar with, the Numismatic Indexes Project, also funded and done by the Harry Bass uh, Foundation, where they indexed uh, 14 ANS and ANS pub and, and uh, ANA publications and other uh, um, journals and magazines. About 72,000, and I was just on there the other day on ANA's site, so it's still alive and you can still get to it, although I couldn't quite figure out how to get to it when I was there, but if you just Google it, it'll take you there directly. I just want to make a point, though. This I wasn't really there because that's when we won the large set, but it said ANS coin photos, and that's when we introduced the JPEG um, pictures, and I think hmm. it would have been Sebastian actually already um, because that was the website. So that was the first beginning of realizing we needed to have photos in addition to these things, but it wasn't clear how to mm -hmm. connect them, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if you clicked on that link, you could see a few of them somehow. I remember that. Hmm. See that JPEG picture? Yeah, I wondered about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that mm -hmm. was what that like was. what those were, just the kind of just showing a whole bunch of a limited yeah, these number. Yeah, these were the JPEGs <laughs> as opposed to the missing. Sense listing, for example, was just um, a listing and then had no photos. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, about the same time, they began talking about uh, converting the library's catalog from the card catalog uh, to go digital with it, and they began to look at this throughout the 1980s, but it, it wasn't really until the late 90s that, I, uh, that 2,000 test records were made available. Uh, conversion was 50% complete by 1999, and the catalog was added to the website in 2000. Ah. <laughs> so, um, UDA came, you came in 1998, I think? Okay. Um, and around this time, Bass uh, requested um, that the ANS find, but the, um, that the ANS find an alternative uh, webmaster. And around this time, Sebastian Heath also come in. He, he came as a part-time part consultant at first in 1999. Uh, by way of introduction, he's a scholar in classical arts. A lot of these people come um, 
through that uh, that way of uh, they have the kind of a background in um, classical art, uh, archaeology, and this sort of thing, and then develop these skills uh, with the digital projects. Um, his interest was in Roman pottery. He's, he's uh, affiliated with ISAW, teaches courses at NYU in the digital humanities. Um, and he's still, I guess, associated with us as a research scientist and, uh, yeah, a fellow at the ANS. Around this time also, uh, Andy Meadows here on the right came, and again, a classic scholar, came in, uh, well, he came later, 2007. Uh, and he is also an ANS trustee. So, around this time, another thing that was kind of launched at, at, at this time, um, was this nomisma. So this kind of gets us to um, the concept of linked open data and the kinds of things we're going to be talking about today where you kind of have uh, a lot of linking going on in the web and you have not only humans reading information on the web but linking together and computers working together and grabbing information and assembling it in new ways uh, and that sort of thing. And a lot of this has to do with having objects and and um, materials and photographs and documents all having a specific place with a specific definition on the internet and a sp 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 specific UR URI uh, uh, a resource identifier um, where these materials can be found and so that they can be, uh, so that there's much interactivity going on. And so Nomismo was one where it was defining, it's like kind of a thesaurus for defining numismatic concepts. Is it schema available online? Um, that I don't know. Somebody else. What is it? The schema? <laughs> schema. So like the whole... The layout of the architecture. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. I, I would think... There's a dedicated website yeah. for Nomisma that lays mm -hmm. out the standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, for Nomisma, yes. Mm -hmm. And is it in broad use after all these years? Yes. Oh, yeah. I think yes. so, yeah. So you know, it, it's the place where you're 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 thinking um, you know it defines terms like Augustus and Octavian and this sort of thing, and making sure that everything is you know uh, machine readable as well as human readable, and giving it um, sp specific definitions. Definitions. So the idea behind this is oh, so Ethan Gruber. So you can't talk about any of this stuff without talking about Ethan. Ethan joined us around 2011, and he's really behind all of this. And you never see him because he's in Virginia, um, but he's kind of. Uh, really puts all of this stuff together. You can see him talking about Nomisma in the background there and these kind of links and this sort of thing. But again, his background is in art and architectural uh, history. I, I never realized this until I got talking to him. I thought he came out of this kind of computer background. Um, in fact, when he came here, um, and he's, I'll talk about our Archer database later, which is for the archives. Uh, as an archivist, we use the thing in, the, in, our, in archives called EAD, Encoded Archival uh, Description, which is an XML. Um, code uh, that we use for um, finding aids. And so usually I'm the only one that knows anything about this uh, when, I'm at, when, I, when I'm anywhere because I'm an archivist, so I use this stuff. But he's an expert in this, apparently. So when he was coming here to work, and I thought, I, I couldn't believe it, somebody that, was, that knew so much about this. And he used that to um, develop, and it's really what is behind Archer, our archives database, which I'll be talking about later. So here's kind of a, the simple idea here, like I was talking about before, with this notion of linked open data. So you have all of the, you have coins, and you have hordes, and you have descriptions of hordes, and you have pictures of coins, and you have the actual um, documents of people writing about coins and this sort of thing, and everything's linked together. I mean, I think we're all kind of used to this idea generally on the internet, of course. Um, but uh, like I say, it's uh, machines talking to machines, but also people uh, being able to pull this information together. So this is kind of a simple layout of that concept. And this is kind of the, uh, the world tied together, the more complex version of that. So with that, I believe I will turn it over to Peter, yeah. who's going to talk about the coins. Yeah. <laughs>